Hi, I'm Wally Brill from the Conversation Design Team at Google. For quite a while now, Minju Kim, Kate Berman, and I have been helping developers create great storytelling and gaming experiences for Google Assistant on smart displays. Along the way, we've learned a lot about what does and doesn't work. So here are some things to keep in mind when you're designing and developing interactive games and stories. Number one, set expectations in the introduction. To make it easy for the user to engage with your experience, your introduction should provide instructions for the interaction and set clear expectations. For games, use the opening as a kind of tutorial to explain the object of the game and how it's played. But remember, the goal of the user is to get started playing quickly, so keep that introduction short, ideally less than a minute or so. In the case of interactive stories, tell the user how long the experience is likely to be. This approach might be as simple as a labeled description in the GUI. Also, be sure to let them know what to expect when they're asked for responses during the narrative. A natural language interface opens lots of creative avenues for design, but it also means there's a greater initial responsibility to articulate the goals of the interaction right from the beginning. Number two. Find the balance between touch and voice interactions. Now, smart displays are designed to be used hands-free, and in the majority of cases, we assume that voice is the primary mode of interaction. In general, anything that a user can accomplish through touch should be able to be done through voice as well. Consider a kid asking for a bedtime story from their bed, or somebody playing a game while cooking with messy hands. Leveraging voice as an interface provides real value to our users. But users also appreciate fast interactions. Reading and tapping can sometimes be faster than listening and speaking. And for some games, touch may be the primary interaction modality. If gameplay would be much easier for the user with tapping, hey, guide them to use touch. Wherever possible, though, make sure the interactions are available through voice as well. Number three, keep the TTS, or text-to-speech, brief. Text-to-speech or computer-generated voices have improved exponentially in the last few years, but they aren't perfect. Through user testing, we've learned that users, especially kids, don't like listening to long TTS messages. Of course, some content, like interactive stories, shouldn't be reduced. But for games, try to keep your script simple. Wherever possible, leverage the power of the visual medium and show, don't tell or consider providing a skip button on the screen so that users can read and move forward without waiting until the TTS is finished. In many cases, the TTS and text on a screen won't always need to mirror each other. For example, the TTS may say, Great job. Let's move to the next question. What's the name of the big red dog? And the text on the screen might simply say, What is the name of the big red dog? Number four. Consider first time and returning users. Frequent users don't need to hear the same TTS instructions repeatedly. Optimize the experience for returning users. If it's a user's first time, try to explain the full context. If they revisit your action, acknowledge their return with a welcome back message and try to shorten or taper the TTS. If you notice that the users return more than three or four times, try to get to the point as quickly as possible. Now, here's an example of tapering the instructions for different users for a word game. Instructions for the first-time user. Just say words you can make from the letters provided. Are you ready to begin? For a returning user. Make up words from the jumbled letters. Ready? And for a frequent user. Are you ready to play? Number five, open the mic properly. The microphone needs to open after every direct question because by asking a question, you're explicitly inviting the user to respond. Needing to say a wake word to open the mic is not intuitive to users in the middle of gameplay and could leave them confused, resulting in missed or repeated utterances and errors. Allow the user to respond as quickly as possible after a question has been asked by opening the mic immediately. Any language which cues the user to respond should be at the end of the prompt, just before the mic opens. This approach prevents the user from attempting to respond while the mic is closed, which causes frustration and creates errors. For example, I have red, green, or blue. Which would you like? As opposed to, Which color would you like? I have red, green, or blue. 
Number six, emphasize questions. One main difference between written and spoken language is that written language is persistent. It remains on the page where it can easily be reread if missed. Because conversation is linear and ephemeral, it's easy to miss when a question is being asked. Make the question clear so that users can understand and respond. Now, there are a few different ways to do this. There could be a change in background music or mood on the screen. Or you could add a short sound or ear con before the question's asked. If you're putting the questions on screen, they should be visible while the TTS is playing. Sometimes the player may want to skip ahead by reading the question and using touch to move forward. Number seven, prepare for no match errors and edge cases. We recommend escalating error handling and context-specific prompting to give users multiple opportunities to re-engage when there's a choice to be made or a question answered. At each choice point of your experience, determine if a user response is required or if you can elegantly move users forward without hearing their choice. In an escalating error strategy, say the initial question is, You can have red, green, or blue. Which color would you like? If there's a no match where the user's response isn't understood, standard practice would be a rapid reprompt, like, Which color was that? If there's another no match, the next response would give a little more context. Would you like red, green, or blue? If they still don't respond with something the system can recognize, you might just move them forward to keep them in the game or story. Let's go with red this time. You could also direct them to use buttons on the screen to make their choice. For situations where the user doesn't respond to a question, the mic will close after a predetermined number of seconds, requiring the user to use touch input. Number eight, support strongly recommended intents. There are some commonly used intents which enhance the user experience. If your action doesn't support them, users might get frustrated. Here's a list. Exit or quit closes the action. Repeat or say that again repeats the immediately preceding content. This should be available everywhere. Play again allows the user to start over. This intent gives users an opportunity to re-engage with their favorite experiences. Help provides more detailed instructions to users who may be lost. Depending on the type of action, this may need to be context specific. Remember to return users to where they left off in gameplay after a help message plays. Pause or resume allows the user to stop and continue the experience. Provide a visual indication that the game has been paused and provide both visual and voice options to resume. Skip moves to the next decision point. Home or menu moves to the home or main menu of an action. Now having a visual affordance for this is a great idea. Without visual cues, it's hard for users to know that they can navigate through voice even when it's supported. Go back moves to the previous page in an interactive story. Number nine, ensure legibility and readability. The smart display is a stationary device and it can be used from a distance in many cases. We recommend using bigger fonts to ensure legibility at minimum 32 point for primary text and 24 point for secondary text. Also using negative space properly may reduce visual clutter. If there's not enough space between the elements, they become hard to read and demand additional effort. Put some breathing room around the object. We recommend putting a 40 pixel margin at the edge of the screen. Number 10, provide visual feedback. When it takes a lot of time to execute a user's request, provide them with proper visual feedback. Instead of using a simple spinner, try to be transparent about what's happening. How much time remains to complete the task? How much of the content has been loaded? What's happening in the system? Also, be sure to give immediate touch feedback to users when they press buttons. It can easily prevent errors caused by double tapping. And finally, number 11, reduce cognitive load. Your screen can help reduce the cognitive load by showing compact information in an organized way. Keep the content on the screen clear, concise, and scannable with the most important information first. Display prompts may need to be a condensed version of the spoken prompts and placed in the top or middle of the screen. Show any responses in suggestion chips at the bottom. 
And if you decide to use an icon button instead of a text button, the icon should be extra clear so that users can execute the button via voice without hesitation. So, there you have it. Our top suggestions for making your interactive games and stories amazing experiences that people will want to use over and over again. We can't wait to see what you'll create next. Thanks for watching.